here this morning because we love you. We're here because we love one another. And I think, Lord, that's that's the beautiful gift that you have given us. This ability to care for one another in a very special way. And we come just thankful that we can be here and that we know that you will Meet us here, that your Holy Spirit will guide us in worship, that you will help us to uh, look at at your word and uh, find the the real true meaning that you want to bring to each of us today. So, Father, be with us and hear us as we worship you. Amen. Would you stand and let's join together in reading our um, Apostles' Creed, our, our statement of faith this morning. It's in your hymnal on 881 or on the screens uh, around the room. So. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe the Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We have to uh, not rely on that. Hmm? We're supposed to be memorizing it. Let's uh, let's join together in singing Majesty, 176 in your hymn, Lord, on the screen.
but come forward and we'll gather a morning offering. Father, we bring our offerings and our gifts and we lay them before you this morning because we love you and we want to say thank you for the way you provide for us and for the way you um, show us the love that is abounding. And so um, accept these gifts and these offerings, Lord, so that, that we can make uh, a difference in our little corner of the world. We want to reach out to those that need to know you better, and we're just thankful that you've placed us here to do that. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. It's wonderful when it works. <laughs> We're just thankful that, uh, that Jenny has the ability to share her music with us even when she's not here. But uh, it's just never quite the same as when she's sitting on that bench. And so, uh, but we get by. It'll be okay. Um, one of the things that we like to do um, is to, to share not only prayer concerns with one another, but we like to remember the times this week that, um, that God has entered our lives in a personal way. And so the first thing I ask uh, at our prayer time is, is where, did you, where did you see God this week in your life or right around you? And I know it's always tempting to say, oh, the cooler weather and the bright sunshiny days and yeah, that, that's good. I'm not knocking that. But I want to know where you met God this week in your life. So, Sandy, good. Salvation Army would be other clothes to move it along, um, but also the prom dresses and wedding dresses that um, yes. we were given over to Heather um, at the Heather Town for their ministry, and she's just so thankful for those. Right. Um, I'm, just I'm so glad we have somewhere for those to go. Yeah. Yeah. We're given such beautiful uh, things at the thrift store, and it's nice that we can... And, and they have been blessed. Good. They have been blessed with know, items that were given to them as well. They can always use monetary sure. donations, but, but the things are, are very important as well. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else? Anybody want to share a moment that, yeah. I had the joy of seeing my grandson Dallas. He got back into school after two years. He was out for COVID, doing what he was doing, and he was 
feel so far away when you get to see him a little bit more like that. Right. Yeah. Susan. I got together with my family and my friends last night at my house and we went to work together and we went to get through all this. Praise <laughs> God. Good. Yeah. Good. I appreciate that. Good. Anybody else want to share a joy or? Yeah, right. Yeah, thank the Lord for good weather Monday when we have a lot of fun. To get a good if you if you think to look, look up at our steeple. Our our uh, spire on top of the steeple is now straight from every direction. It looks so good. And if you didn't get to hear it, um, Sandy rang the bell this morning, and I understand that's a first for about. Uh, for a long time, anyhow, <laughs> for a long time. And um, we have to, to thank Rex and the people that were up there working in the attic and stuff. They cleaned everything out, put the, the rope in the encasement so uh, it can slide up and down easily without dragging anything down with it from up there. And um, I just think it's a real testimony here in our little community. Um, for people to hear that church bell ring every week. So uh, thank you for all that you've been doing, Rex, to make things beautiful around here and make it all work good. Anybody else? Terry. I guess I had the privilege of going up to Rochester, Michigan on Thursday and Friday and experiencing and hearing a lot about leader dogs of the blind. Rochester, Michigan is a place where they raise guide dogs for blind people. And the amazing thing is these dogs are free of charge to anybody who's blind. All they have to do is get in contact with them and make the arrangements and see what they really need. And here's a plug for that real quick, yeah. too. They don't have to be totally blind to uh, qualify for one of these dogs. So if you know someone that is, that is considered legally blind, even though they still have some slight vision, and they would be interested in a guide dog, let Terry know. So, go ahead. Okay. I think that's pretty well covered. Okay. okay. That's just a really, it's just a, it's more than just a project for the Lions Club. That's a real ministry. The Lions of Michigan is the one that got that project started. Yeah. That the Lions Club around uh, this area has supported them. Yeah. Uh, pitched in and supported them now. So it's, it's quite a uh, project. Yeah. Any other praises or God moments that you want to share? 
What about prayer concerns? Are there those that we could lift up in prayer this week? Oh. Eleanor? Okay. Keep Eleanor and her whole family. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Continue prayers for Hank. He's totally off the hydrocortisone, so now he goes till October 28th. And the first week he was off, he got a cold. But they were able to. Boy, that's that's a good. Normal, and he yeah. didn't have to stress dose or anything. So that, Very good. that was good. So okay. Just prayers that he stays healthy okay. until they can test him. Yeah. Uh, Pray for my husband Dan and he travels back to Cincinnati this afternoon. I don't have safe travel. Okay. Okay. Keep Dan in the prayers for safe travel. Is he having back surgery September 7th? Oh my. Okay. And unspoken, please. And unspoken? Okay. Now you just continue prayers for mom. Okay, for Jerry. Terry? For my sister, uh, she was in the hospital early week. She is now back at home, but uh, she's having some, uh, I don't know what you call it. Uh, health issues. Uh, yeah, yeah, health yeah. issues. They yeah. thought it was TIA, but they decided it's not that. Her, her, name, her name is Sandy. Yeah. So you want to keep her in your prayers? If they're in, oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Well, let's let's go before the Lord then, and let's take some time to just talk to Him. And Lord, we do come, just bowing before You this morning, uh, bringing You our praise. You You heard the 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 people talk about moments where they recognized Your hand in their life this week, and. Um, it's good for us to be able to see you at work and to share those moments with others. And so we thank you. We thank you that make, you make yourself evident for us to see. We do want to um, give you praise that our friend Kay is able to be back with us today. Um, she's, uh, I'm sure, having lots of uh, difficulty just doing life things, so to be able to get herself around and get here is um, it's a, a good thing and we're thankful for her to be here but Lord we ask that you would touch her shoulder and her arm and just help it to heal quickly and uh, let her be able to get back to doing the things that she loves to do we want to uh, lift up Eleanor and all of her family as they help her move this week it, that's uh, a pretty big job and um, we, we just pray that you will help her to be calm and peaceful through all of it and, um, and just allow it to be a good transition for her. We're thankful that, that Hank is doing so well without his um, medication and that uh, he'll be able to just work his way into being as, uh, just a normal young man as he continues to go without it and that we'll begin to see... Um, see him respond in a lot of ways to uh, not having to be on that medicine anymore. We lift up Chip to you in prayer. Uh, we know he's just had issues with his back so much this last year especially. And uh, we pray that, that this surgery will be um, really successful and that he'll be up and about again as quickly as possible. We pray for Sandy. We ask, Lord, that you would um, help the doctors determine exactly what's going on with her and help her, Lord, then to uh, respond to any treatment or medication that they give her so that she can be her active, normal self. We lift up Jerry as um, she continues to uh, just struggle, Lord, with um, the, the uh, issue of movement. We know how difficult it is for her, and we're, we're sad that she's not able to be with us and to, to go around like she would like to. We pray for uh, traveling mercies for Dan and for uh, Jenny and Frank and for all of our families and friends that are on the move today. We pray for safety and that they can 
uh, make it to their destinations and their homes with no problem. And Lord, we pray too for those things that uh, we don't necessarily feel the need to speak out loud about, those things that are deep in our hearts. And it is such a, a wonderful gift to know that, that you hear our need for your attention in those ways too. And we thank you that you will um, answer those prayers. And Lord, we, we lift up um, this whole congregation. Lord, it's um, just fun to see the, the um, happiness and the joy with which everyone greets each other and the way that um, they truly love and care for each other. For that, we're so thankful. It really does feel like a family, and we're glad for that. And Lord, as we gather uh, like a family, we like to pray as a family should. And that's praying the way Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you'd like to, um, we'll sing Where He Leads Me. It's on the screens or in your hymnal on page 338. And you can just remain seated for this song if you'd like. So let's join our voices.
good singing this morning. Wow. Okay, if you want to take your Bible out and turn to Hebrews <coughs> with me, we're, we're going through the book of Hebrews about a, a, a chapter a week, but um, this week we're not going to do all of chapter 5. Uh, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 10, <clears throat> and then next week uh, we'll pick up at uh, 5.11 and read through all of chapter 6 because that entire section is kind of thematically related. So we're just going to look at 5, 1 through 10 this morning. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says, Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Jesus Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and who was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. The word of God for the people of God. Praise, Praise peace God. to God. Well, last week... Um, if you remember, the writer of Hebrews introduced um, the idea that Jesus was our high priest. And I know for us that may be a little bit difficult to understand because I'm not sure we understand the concept of high priest like the Jewish people were used to thinking about their high priest. Um, this was um, probably in, in their faith um, uh, understanding high priest was the only person that could go into the Holy of Holies where uh, God would meet in that space. So for the Jewish people, the high priest was the next thing, the, the highest um, faith person that they could even think about. So um, the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand that Jesus for us, is very much like the high priest was for the Israelites and for the Jewish people. He said that, um, that we have a high priest who understands our weaknesses, and uh, that's because he faced temptation like we do in every way. And yet, Jesus was without sin. The result, the writer says, is that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So um, this high priest theme continues here in chapter 5, and it'll be repeated more as we continue on into Hebrews. But I want us today to just stop and think about what this means. Jesus is our high priest. What does the writer of Hebrews mean about that when when he talks about high priest, our high priest. Well, he lists three primary qualifications that, that any person that um, becomes a high priest has to fulfill. First of all, the high priest has to come from among the people. In other words, he is one of us. The second qualification is that the high priest's job is to represent people in matters related to God, um, to offer our offerings and our gifts and our sacrifices. 
the writer emphasizes that uh, the high priest is able to do this compassionately because he is one of us. He is subject to the same weaknesses that we are. The third qualification is that the position of high priest is not a job that one chooses for oneself. It's a position that one receives through the calling of God. So the Hebrew writer lists these three qualifications to be a high priest, and then he tells us how Jesus fulfills every one of those, starting with, he kind of goes in reverse order. He starts with the third one and works back to the first qualification. That third qualification was the, the position of high priest is not a job that you choose for yourself. He says, God appointed Jesus to be our high priest. And if you don't believe it, there are messianic prophecies in the Psalms that point to this. Secondly, Jesus stood between God and man, offering up prayers and petitions on our behalf. And lastly, Jesus earned the right to be our high priest through his reverent submission and his obedience. Now, the writer of Hebrews uh, closes out this section by introducing something or someone completely new. He says that Jesus was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. How many of you have ever heard of him? See, he's an Old Testament guy, and uh, we Christians somehow, we forget that that's part of our Bible too. So um, we'll talk about Melchizedek a little more in a couple of weeks. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself right now. But for now, I'm just going to say he's a kind of a mysterious character in the Old Testament. Uh, If you want to read a little bit about him, go to Genesis 14. You'll find him there. But the thing that's important to us to know about Melchizedek is that he kind of symbolized Christ to the people even way back then. Okay? Okay? But for today, we're just going to look at Jesus, our high priest. How many of you remember the song, One of Us? I'm not going to sing it. The the chorus went something like this. uh, What if God was one of us, just a slob like one of us, just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home? Now, some people like that song. Some people were offended by it. But I think it does ask a really interesting question. What if God was one of us? Do you know the New Testament teaches that God is, in fact, one of us? It teaches that his son, Jesus Christ, who, if you remember, it has existed from eternity, throughout eternity, from before time he existed. He created the world. We, we talked about that earlier. Jesus created the world himself, that Jesus chose to leave the splendor of heaven and enter human history being born in a stable in a little town called Bethlehem. He became one of us so that we can become one with him, one with God. But there was a barrier. You know that barrier that stood between us and God? That barrier that we call sin? Those things like willful disobedience, rebellion, selfishness, pride. Uh, We could go on and on. All of our sin was erased and eliminated. It was gone. It was done away with once and for all because of Jesus' action on the cross. That means now, today, for us, nothing is standing between us and God. Now, you might say, oh, wait a minute, I'm still a sinner. And that's true. We all, we all are sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus Christ paid the price for our sin and the sins of the whole world. Somebody else might say, oh, wait a minute, 
I'm not only a sinner, I sin a lot. The same sins day after day. Even sins I promise not to do anymore, I wind up doing. Even when I try not to sin, I wind up sinning. You know what? That just makes you human. And it makes you in need of God's grace. The good news is that God's grace is available. Forgiveness is yours through Jesus Christ. We can approach the throne with confidence. And we can be sure to receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. That's what Jesus came to make available to everyone, everyone who's willing to call upon his name. If you want to be forgiven, if you want to be clean through and through, if you want to be spiritually connected to God, the God of the universe, you can be. Jesus makes it possible. All you have to do is receive him. Receive him into your life. That, my friends, is what they call the good news. And it is good news. But you know what? The good news gets even better. You can be forgiven absolutely and completely and a whole lot more. Life in God is more than just having the penalty of your sin wiped away. It has to do with having the presence of your sins wiped away. That means you don't have to just be glad that you get to go to heaven. It means that you can live a life right now that is more. I think over and over we hear it referred to as abundant life. You, accepting Christ into your life means that you can overcome those negative tendencies and those destructive habits that the human race is known for. Jesus came not only to pay the price for our sin, but he came to show us how to live. In Jesus, we see what it means to be fully human and fully alive in God. In Jesus, we see the perfect example that we need to follow. So Hebrews 5 tells us about Jesus, our high priest. It shows us what a life lived right looks like. It shows how Jesus fulfilled his purpose here on earth in becoming our high priest. And it shows how we, each one of us, can fulfill our purpose on earth by following Jesus' example. We're told to imitate Christ. But the fact is that there are many things that he did that we know are impossible for us to imitate. Let's face it. I don't think anybody walked on water to get here this morning. I don't think any of us can turn water into wine. Well, we may not be able to imitate his miracles, but we can imitate his attitude. The attitude in which he approached his relationship with his father. When Jesus came to earth as a man, he achieved his full potential. So today, I want to help us see how we can achieve our full potential in God by following Jesus' example. Here's three keys. Number one, we must seek God's call for our life. We must seek it. Um, in, re in respect to Jesus being our high priest, remember the writer of Hebrews said, no one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son, today I've become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Again, there's that name. What the writer is saying here is that, that Jesus didn't come to do his own will. He didn't come to choose his own path. He came to do the will of God. He came to do what God the Father called him to do. He indicated this when he was here on earth because he said in John 5.30, 
I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. Earlier he said, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. So Jesus came to do God's will, not his own. This is an example that I think each one of us can follow. God has a will and a plan for your life. He has a call for your life. Your objective should be to, to uncover that calling, to figure out what it is, and then to spend your life doing it. I think we sit around and we wait so many times for God to make it evident for us what he's wanting us to do. But the writer of Hebrews tells us we need to be seeking that. We need to figure it out. We need to find out what God wants us to do. Um, now, some of you may already be pretty sure of what God's doing in your life, with your life, for the good of the kingdom. You, you may have that figured out. But if you don't have, if you're not certain what God's calling you to do for the kingdom, then I encourage you to seek it. Ask God at every turn, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What, who is it that you want me to be? I can tell you a couple things about God's will. First of all, he won't keep it a secret. He wants you to know. And the second thing is, he'll reveal it to you when you're ready to do it. And when he does reveal it to you, I have a feeling you're going to be a lot like I was. You're going to go, wow, what? Are you sure? You want me to stand up there and preach your word? Ah, uh, come on, guy. But you know what? He has a better vantage point than we do. He can see his plan laid out forever and ever. So he sees what's needed from the beginning to the end. He has a way of, of looking at things in terms of eternity, of, of the big picture. We only have eyes that can see about this much of what's going on in, in eternity. You know, we have a tendency to, to look at things and, and say, oh, you know, teaching is really a nice profession. The pay may not be great, but that long summer vacation is wonderful. And it's interesting work. But here's how God probably looks at it. He probably says, I'm not just calling you to teach because it's a, a good career choice. I'm calling you to shape the destiny of the students you encounter. I'm calling you to be a person of influence, to make an impact that will be felt for generations to come. You see, no matter what job you have, there is a calling built into it in a way um, that means you are helping build God's kingdom here on earth and you will be making a difference in the lives of others. You have to look for that part of your job, though. Sometimes we just go to work. Jesus came not to do his own will. He came to do the will of the Father who sent him. That needs to be our objective too. Here's the second key. We have to make a, a daily devotional life our top priority. Now, I don't doubt that probably most of you here pick up your Bible sometime during the week. But let me tell you, Jesus' example shows us that we're to pick it up a whole lot more than that. And the writer of Hebrews even encourages it. He tells this story about Jesus. He says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. His reverent submission. When you read the Gospels, you notice right away how Jesus spent a lot of time, a great deal of time, in prayer, and also in just communion, just together time with his Father. 
Do you remember what Jesus did on the night when he was facing his death? He was in the garden. It says he, he took his disciples and he had them stay in one place and he went a little further on and, and, and it tells about how he prayed. And he prayed so fervently that, that it was like great. The blood dripped off of his face like drips of, of sweat. He was alone in that garden and he prayed. Remember his prayer? He, he said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. I believe that, that Jesus knew that there was no getting out of what was going to happen, what he had been called to do. And yet it was through him praying that he found the strength to do what he had to do. This is why he told these disciples, keep alert and pray, otherwise temptation will overpower you. A devotional life was top priority for Jesus. And now, <clears throat> think about it. If the Son of God needs to pray in order to fulfill his purpose on earth, I have a feeling all of us need to pray a whole lot more. D.L. Moody was once asked about what it might be like in heaven. He said, well, next to the wonder of seeing my Savior, I think the wonder will be that I made so little use of the power of prayer. I think the same could be said for most of us. We don't make enough use of prayer. God has, has made himself available to us, to you and to me individually. We can, count, we can call on him any time of the day or night, and we know, he tells us, he will listen. We can engage in conversation with him any time, Anytime. So if you really want to fulfill your potential as a human, you have to make your devotional life a top priority. Allow yourself the luxury. Yes, it's a luxury. Allow yourself the luxury of talking to God all day, all day long, about every detail in your life. I don't know if you do this, but... I have a tendency to talk to myself when I'm alone. And I wonder why I don't talk to God instead. I think his company would be a whole lot better than mine. Here's the third key for achieving your full potential in God. Be ready to grow through suffering and obedience. The writer of Hebrews says something very interesting and maybe a little confusing at first. He's talking about Jesus and he says in verse 8, Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who will obey him. So what does that mean? He learned obedience. He was made perfect. Does that mean that at some point he'd been disobedient? Does it mean that at some point he was not perfect? No. That's not what the writer's saying. Theologian George Guthrie says that learned obedience means that Jesus arrived at a new stage of experiencing. Having passed through the school of suffering, he now was perfection. He'd sort of graduated from the school of hard knocks, so to speak. Here's what I kind of think it means. Jesus came to earth to be fully human. He was literally one of us. He didn't float around from place to place with, on a little crowd with a bunch of angels singing in the background. That's not the way he presented himself to us. He subjected himself to the the same limitations that we have. When he was tired, he needed to sleep. When he was hungry, he needed to eat. When he was working on wood, I bet he got splinters in his finger. He had to learn from Mary how to walk and talk. He probably learned from Joseph how to drive a nail and build a shelf. He also learned the scriptures. He learned how to pray. 
he learned how to do God's will. In the course of doing God's will, he endured times of suffering. While he was alive, and especially at the time of his death, his suffering, his obedience, made him perfect. George Guthrie indicates the Greek word for perfect means having completed a mission or fulfilled a task. Here's what it means for us. God has placed a call on your life, each one of you. He's designed a mission especially for you. You grow into that mission through obedience and suffering. You might say, but I don't like to suffer. Well, no one does. But it's part of the human experience. Everyone suffers. People who believe in God suffer. People that don't believe in God suffer. People who try to do God's will suffer. People that ignore God's will suffer. Suffering is a universal reality. But God's work in your life allows a a special way for you to grow when you're suffering. He uses the moments of suffering, that's that reverent submission, he uses those moments of suffering to make you perfect in fulfilling his call on your life. For those who live a life without God, the suffering they go through makes no sense. You know, they go, why? Why do I have to go through this? Why? What's this all about? It, it's something they try to avoid, even though it can't be fully avoided. But for those who live in this reverent submission to God's suffering for that comes into our life, It becomes a tool for God to use to make you the person he's designed you to be. And it helps you do the job he's called you to do. Jesus learned obedience from what he suffered. His suffering perfected him to fulfill God's call on his life here on earth. It's the same with us. Instead of questioning, you know, why did this happen to me? Why am I having to go through this awful whatever? Learn to say, what am, I, what am I supposed to learn? What is this going to teach me? That's reverent submission to the suffering of this life. Jesus has given us an example to follow. In the same way that he sought to do the will of God, not his own will, in the same way that He lived his life in reverent submission to God, making prayer and fellowship with God a top priority. In the same way he learned obedience through suffering, we are called to follow in his footsteps. So here's what I hope you take away today. I hope you take a commitment to focus on doing God's will. A commitment to spending more time in God's presence, reading his word more, praying. I hope you take away a commitment to face the suffering in your life, those difficulties, with a teachable spirit, an attitude of reverent submission. When God became one of us, this is what he did, and it's our example to follow. Amen. If you will, um, let's close our service this morning by singing, Are Ye, Are Ye Able? 5.30 in your hymnal or up on the screen. Are Ye Able? Shall we stand together?
You have a job, so to speak, to work on, and that is to figure out what God's call is for your life. So go, go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and be like Jesus. Amen.